So we have always open and close the same affirmation. So please repeat after me. May those from under our feet, May those from under our feet breathe the warmth of community unto us. Breathe the warmth of community unto us. So the peace and creativity we see. So the peace and creativity we see. Mounts our bodies and sits on the chairs of our hearts. Mounts our bodies and sits on the chairs of our hearts. Spreading joy and love around us all. Spreading joy and love around us all. Ashe. Ashe. Why do you organize this event? Like, what, is, what does it mean to you? Uh, the Share Your Heart, Share Your World High School Poetry Workshop is to provide free access for local schools, and unfortunately we can't fit all of the schools in Vermont, but um, a number of schools this year for, to participate in an all-day workshop and also have a chance to share their poetry with each other and with the workshop leaders um, in a communal space, particularly taking place on a school day so that everyone who normally would be in school would be able to attend instead of a lot of the um, events which are usually held in the evenings or during weekends and it's hard to uh, find time to do so. And then the way to write this poem could be however you want to do it. So you start with that moment, you're, you're, you're restrained to this world of impossible actions, right? The clock was looking for a way to pass the time. The clock did not care for reading. It did not, not, it did not like many things to do with words. The clock didn't like eating. Even now, it didn't think about curds. So the clock went out for a walk. But where should, it, should the clock go, thought the clock. Perhaps to the dock. Oh, how we fought not to think the thoughts that rhymed with clocks. <laughs> but the clock didn't care for literary conventions and wordplay. The clock balked. It had walked down to the dock, and it was already 8 o'clock. The clock wishes the rhyming would stop. Oh, how it, how it could not. Tick tock, thought the clock. It better get home before it turns to 9. Oh my gosh. That was really good. I love the humor. Yeah, okay. Why do you think it's important for students to come out here and learn and write poetry? Well, I think that poetry allows a different um, angle or perspective to think about your own personal life, historical events, current events, um, trying to make a sense of this chaotic and strange world and kind of funnel it into a more compact and new or strange form. Um, just to kind of like sort through all of the information that's floating around us and to kind of channel it into our more creative, poetic, streamlined way. That's why I am interested in writing poems. Yes, yeah, like I said, I'm going to share briefly about how I came to the art form and then we'll do an opening affirmation to kind of set the tone for what we're going to engage in together, followed by just a number of writing prompts. Um, I will say that the prompts are just that prompts, so they, they give you an opportunity to explore your imagination and creativity, but you don't have to stay beholden to them. Like if there's something that's more pressing on your heart and your mind, if you feel you want to go in that direction, you can totally use that time and space for that. She's a very rude child, very prestigious too. Her hair is kept in two perfect Dutch braids that frame her freckled, strewn face. She's loud and always imaginable. She stomps through the halls at the crack of dawn, the day's most vulnerable hour, and wakes up her siblings as they're trying to recover from the dawn before. She's greedy. She stuffs her face at mealtime and belches in between handfuls. And when she's done, she leaves messes she promised she'll clean up tomorrow. But I can only hope she can change. She can wash her grubby hands and walk lighter in the halls. She can share her meals and say excuse me when she belches, and hopefully, American gr America can grow and keep her promises that she made yesterday. <laughs> this poem is called The Cry of Fall, A Rise, and A Brick. A cry, a fall, a rise, a brick. You can't tell me I'm nothing. I'm done with your tricks. You stormed my bar, claiming that you had a warrant, but what ensued was nothing short of torment. Don't you see? At the Stonewall Inn, the walls are thin. A pin dropped. We all stopped. We knew what was happening. A cry for help. Now this was just the beginning. Men love men and women love women. Coming out shouldn't feel like a burden. 
There's so much more than pink and blue, of which are just mere colors on the color wheel. I don't see where they get their appeal. Having sexual preference is not a sin. What is a sin is hating others because of their skin, because they were born in the wrong body. And it's not their fault that they feel this way because to you, it's just a chemical imbalance that takes place in the brain. Calling me by my dead name was never a choice, and it's a lame excuse to keep doing it just because it sounds nice. It's not my fault that I don't have preference. It's not my fault that I don't fit into the binary of gender. And most importantly, it's not my fault that you're not okay with that. It's not a man in a dress walking down the street or a skirt hanging just below the knees. It's a person merely doing as they please. Biological advantage does not outweigh skill, yet still, you tell me that I cannot participate because I was born in the wrong skin. Something that is a constant struggle within. So the next time that you attempt to counteract the fact, remember that. Remember that it was never my choice. Acknowledge that I still have a voice. Remember that. When I first came out, I was so overjoyed that I had found a new part of me that I so deeply enjoyed. But it brought you tears and an overwhelming fear that your daughter wouldn't walk down the aisle with a man because your child was queer. But this is so much bigger than you and me, bigger of your fear of me being me. Many members have been lynched. But despite all this, we aren't finished. We aren't tired and we aren't weary. Your shots and slashes only increase our fury. We've been torn and beat down. We've bloodied our knees. But when we get back up, there's no frown. Instead, we put on our crown. But why is it that straight pride exists? They want the good, but avoid the hardships. They don't get kicked out for loving who they love. Their privacy isn't invaded. They're not invalidated. They aren't told that they don't exist. Well, you get the gist. We strive to be free of the handcuffs of society, like a majestic bird gliding over the salt water of the sea, to feel the love and support flow through our majestic wings, to not be labeled, which seems to be merely a fable, to open our eyes and to see past society's lies that convince us we're not enough if we celebrate our pride. So fly high, my love, be that dove. Be free of the fear of coming out as queer. Step out of the closet whenever you're ready. It's all right to go slow and steady. Trust me, honey, I'm not being petty, but hey, love is love. Thank you so much for sharing that poem. I hope you send it to me if you would like. Um, what are like future hopes and goals for the Sun Dog of Poetry Foundation? So one of the big events that we run every year is Justice and Poetry. And it's a, um, so while this is a, uh, the Share Your Heart, Share Your World workshop is mostly for high school students, or it is for high school students, the Justice and Poetry is all ages. And um, this year, the theme is Native Voices and specifically highlighting Benaki Voices in Vermont. So we're hosting an event this summer and it's definitely going to be a big, um, event for, for us to put on, so I'm a little worried about it, but it'll be great. Um, it'll be at the Kilcare State Park. That's in July 22nd, so that's something in the near future. Um, and then maybe in the further future, a year from now or five years, just being able to expand our organization to host a number of different kinds of events um, more frequently throughout the year and also to a wider um, audience so that to reach more people and have more folks be aware of Sundog Poetry and what we do, our missions. And it's it's Main, Street, Main Street Landing's um, contribution to the, uh, the arts, to all of us, and at, at their nonprofit rates. It's, it's very helpful to many groups, including us. And uh, many thanks to our managing director, Francis Cannon. And you've all met um, already our, our presenters, uh, Sam, Meg, uh, Karen, and Rajni. Big hand for them. So, 
Sundog was founded by Mary Jane Dickerson and Tamara Higgins, both good poets, uh, back in the 2014. And the, this particular event, the Share Your Heart event, has been going on four or five times. And um, we have other events. We've just uh, finished the, our second book award. Uh, this year's winner was a gentleman by the name of Michael Fleming from Putney. Beautiful book. We have a handful of copies back there. The title of the book is Bags and Tools, a wonderful, powerful piece of poetry. And the book launch that we had just last weekend was a, a huge hit. And we'll be doing that again. And many other, many other uh, programs for the Bellows Free um, folks from St. Albans, we will have a Justice and Poetry event at Kilcare State Park July 22nd, a Friday. We'll um, be posting more information about that. So, and also, big thanks to all of our contributors Grants from the Vermont um, Council on Arts, the Vermont Humanities Council. Some of this money comes from the federal government. Money and grants that keeps this organization moving along, helping to foster the art of poetry and to present it to the public. So Frankie, on to you. One more thank you to Mike Egan for delivering the pizza. The future is here. Man burns at a certain degree, but I was burned a little slower. When I went into school, I left a trail of blackened footprints in my classroom, spelling words never starred. At the end of the earth, we'll be locked in our own spelling mistakes. Our arms are on the legs of our mother so she won't leave. Our heads filled with beer, the light receding. What kind of death is reserved for me? The green plastic soldier has his gun up against everything. And what does one do with a gun, really? I've only held three my entire life. The third I held was the first I used. I was with Rebecca and her father deep in the woods of Vermont. She was staying with me in the heap and I shot at a beer can until my hands went numb. And I loved her the whole time. Car accidents and barbiturates, the way she got wasted and knocked teeth into her lap and told me I loved her too much. What was all that? And love is either perpetually filthy or intermittently lewd. I'm sweeping the entire apartment because it's mine forever, and that's valid too. Domestic eroticisms. The way he gets up out of bed before you and puts on clothes and can't find his keys. All of it, without parents, without children, without roommates, it feels good to get something back. I know how crazy hard it is to organize something like this, so I applaud Sundog for their amazing work in doing this, and I got to creep on all the classes today and see really astounding conversations happening, really astounding teaching happening. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was frankly humbled by it. And, and, the, and the words that you guys wrote were, were, were amazing too. So I'm just, I'm just up here giving you some poems and then we'll talk about poetry together and do some writing, more writing. Just absurd amounts of writing today. Oh dear, I keep thinking I get it and I'll tell you about it. But there's nothing to tell, apparently. Nothing concrete anyway. They say that is the way with the great ineffable mystery. To believe in nothing makes no difference. My sister tells me things that frighten me. What I mean is, how did we get here? Made of gingerbread in the oven, eaten by the mother, eaten by the wolf. My little pale nephew standing on the porch explaining lava in the netherworld, that if you fall in a certain hole in his game, you keep falling forever, and you don't get to keep. 
any of the things you made. Oh, Minecraft reference in that moment. <laughs> All right, so um, I, we've done a lot today. We, you've done a lot today. Um, I really want right now, this whatever the rest of this time together we have, to be uh, honestly a conversation. Why is poetry important? Why should we write it? What, what, are our, what are our misconceptions about what poetry is? And I'm sure some of those have been debunked today already in your workshops. But I think back to my anyone's general education in poetry in schools and and how it's taught um, and thinking about why one would want to write it or read it and there's just so much misinformation about the power of what poetry can do and as someone who's obsessed with it I I'm often curious about why I'm not a particularly intellectual person you know I feel like very intuitive in the way that I learn. And uh, a lot of the times people avoid poetry because they think it's like a code or it's too hard or confusing um, or mushy or whatever. And uh, I, I just, for me I think what I like to come back to is a love of language and a real love of playing with the capabilities of language and sculpting language, you know, because poetry is so much smaller than prose, right? Uh, we were just told to write about something that is uh, personally important to us. The abuse of the user. This is called a portrait of apology. It's called Elizabeth. It's a little chaotic, but it's called self-portrait of a polar bear. It's, it's called green-eyed. It doesn't have a title yet because I haven't found one that fits it. Um, okay. <laughs> the butterfly wishes not to fly. People compliment the insect for its wings, but what about its eyes? I barely believe you should love me sometimes. For when I try to heal you, I only see you flinch from the sting of the acetone. Let's go back to when I had too much slack. Tragic abuse always related to substance use. Coke and good smoke poked at the mind. Now lately I find I'm lost. Late to start a simple life, sore of thinking of the closed doors. Elizabeth is the name our mother gave you, a name she thought would lift you into the next tax bracket. I've been taken away from you more times than I can count, lifted out of your life with the sound of airplane engines and washed away with hotel soap. I don't know how to improvise, so I follow the sheet music, black notes on white, sometimes cream-colored paper, like the eyes of a polar bear in a snowstorm. Green-eyed, to be jealous or envious. Example, oh, beware my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Good at flying, but what else? The butterfly wishes for more. If people could see how difficult it was to go from cocoon to wings, would they congratulate it? Or would they just say how ugly it was before? I am a 50-year fire, buried by the stones you stacked to smother me, not out of hatred, but out of mercy, out of love. Something good happens in my life. I go to the store and buy a box of sushi to eat. Something bad happens, I eat the sushi anyway, like a polar bear catches a seal and devours it until the next point in its long trek through the snow when it must stop and eat again. Strong and the other right, perpetuating a prepared image of hate. When they finally realized the damage done, Dare was tragically unprepared. Students only joked when shown coke, plus bathrooms are still filled with fruity smelling smoke. Growing up, I always wanted to be the best. Sure, being good at something is easy, but being the best is different. I'm decent enough at performing, good with people, and okay at art, but I've never been able to change somebody's perspective, to touch somebody's heart and grace the places that have never been touched before, 
to enlighten and bring new meaning to something that was once broken and torn apart. The name Elizabeth appears next to the date and time on my phone and I am relieved. I miss you, my screen lights up, I love you. Between the lines I read the words, I forgive you. In my response I hide and I'm sorry, behind casual conversation and questions about school. I'm sorry for leaving, for not being there, not suffering with you. But as much as I wanted to, I never could. I burned you too once when you reached out to touch my lips, but they were bent around a bottle of whiskey. I never wanted to make you hurt like that again. Rehabilitation can lead the crooked to salvation. A justice that brings joy is an option for the judicial system. A world where addicts aren't automatically problematic, rather sick in a way beyond psychosomatic. I'm sorry for our white mother who messed up your curls but always did my hair just fine. Your eyes matching hair, matching skin, and not matching mine looked down on by blue eyes for the language that should have been yours, taken away by people who never wanted you to speak it, uprooted for your life with the people that could have taught it to you. I'm sorry that our mother never taught it to you. In the end, this feeling lies in the things I want, things that you hear people talk about when they're describing the perfect person. I want to be able to write poetry that never fails to impress, to read all of the classics and never have to look at the same sentence over and over and over again without understanding it. I want to sway my teachers by writing and creating something that they're truly proud of, but I can't recall the last time I really did any of this. Do you remember every day at six I made your breakfast? Do you remember? I spent all my money on lunch for you. Do you remember? I snuck us into the good playground, the one behind the private school because the public one gave you splinters, because I remember. Marked on my calendar, I see the words Elizabeth's birthday, and I remember something else. I remember hiding under benches to get out of the rain, eating the candy I bought us, trying to keep it from getting wet. I remember the scrapes on your knees, knees and the tears that weren't quite gone from your eyes. Tiny bubbles fizzed inside little glass bottles of Coke. You picked them because they said Mexico on the label and you asked me why I left. Treat them with care rather than glare. Treat them kindly and fair. Treat them with empathy and love. This might save them from their life above. I hope my heart may help. I'll take my time to share my tears. I hope in return you'll share your fears to help us all stay safe through the years. It's gross, but honestly, I just want people to wish they could be like me. But there's always someone that does it better. Someone that does this selflessly. Someone that's smarter or prettier or more talented. And I'll sit in front of them and I'll pick them apart limb for limb and mistake by mistake like I'm some sort of qualified critic doing exactly what I worry they'll do to me. The fire, that burns in <laughs> the fire that burns in Hades town is like a passion that lives inside the polar bear, but not outside, because then the ice would melt faster than it's already melting, and at least the jellyfish would have more room to swim and swim and live forever immortal, just like the god of the underworld himself, Hades. I have small-scale survivor's guilt, that shame a person feels when they get out but have to leave someone behind to do it. Why didn't they take you? Why did they leave you? Why did I leave you? You told me once that you wished it was me, that you wished I was the one locked up, that your dad was still with you, but that you were stuck with me, and that you hated me for it, well, I do too. I want it to be how it was before. I want to take you to the park with me. Our cousin can drive us there and back, and we can pretend he isn't high, and he can pretend that we don't know. And this time, I'll remember to bring Band-Aids for you, this time, when you scrape your painfully thin arms and legs on the ground, you'll have someone to fix it. And this time, when the cans pile up on the counter and make their way onto the kitchen floor, I'll sweep them out of the way for you. I'll make you an easy path to the door, and I'll set out your favorite shoes for you. And this time, you won't fall behind me, tripping over the piles and burning your hands on cigarette butts. Your lungs will no longer be filled with smoke, because I will build you new windows to let in fresh air. I'll get rid of every cigarette on earth because I know how much you hate the smell. And this time, when I look behind me through the doorway, 
I won't see you trapped behind a pile of cans too tall for you to climb over. Politicians, please promise me, try to discover that there is a chance for them to recover. The butterfly wishes it was a caterpillar, small and out of the way, but free. The butterfly doesn't want to fly because that's all it can do. Hades, when he calls for Eurydice, too early and the white winds blow cold through the city, the big city, the city where you don't want an SUV. No, because you want to move fast, straight as the clo crow flies or the snowy owl through the breeze. The way my math notebook flies out of my hand and lands on the couch. <laughs> Thank you. I must have said I'm sorry a million times and you accepted each one without grief but I have never accepted so much as one myself. I'll sit and watch the words carefully grace the room, wrapping around the hearts of those with their heads in their hands, as they stare with glassy eyes and gentle smiles. In their mind, admiration is a weak word to describe what they're experiencing. This whole time I've been distracted with grabbing all of the low-hanging fruit for so long that the shiniest and sweetest apples at the top of the tree have fallen and gotten rotten. Now I could sit and blame this on something else, but despite their wanting to be an excuse, in the end it's just me. Me and my writhing jealousy and disgusting back basket full of rotten apples. But maybe I was born to be this way. I do have green eyes after all. So please, beware my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. This, this is from Meg's workshop where it was specifically where I most felt like myself. It has to do with a large breakfast because if I allowed myself, I would eat a large breakfast every day. It is my favorite meal, but then I would get fat. Trust me, it happened once. Granted, this was also when I was in my 20s and I didn't realize alcohol had calories. I was most specifically myself at age 10 and she reappeared again when I was in Montreal with my family at a hotel. And the day started with a big breakfast because you can escape reality when you stay at a hotel. Soaps that aren't yours, shampoo for free, a Bible. There was eggs and bacon, but also cereal, granola with fresh berries, and fresh pressed juice, all kinds. Pancakes, too, with real maple syrup and free refills of coffee. Lots and lots of coffee. And I only had myself in a long morning ahead of me. Like those many weekend mornings, I would go to breakfast with my parents and my grandma, and the only part of my day that held an agenda was the time I would give later to my Cabbage Patch kids. I could see myself in their dimpled faces and dimpled limbs, huggable, happy, carefree, lovable, even if a couple inches thick. Breakfast, hot pancakes, endless coffee, fresh squeezed orange juice, real syrup, nothing artificial, only me, only 10, or feeling like 10 again. Here we go, Harriet's first crush. <laughs> On a Sunday afternoon, my kinder kindergartner offhandedly mentions her plan for Monday. I can't wait to go to school tomorrow, she tells me while we pull sorrel and morning glories from the early spring soil. She notes my surprise and continues, I'm going to tell Walt that I have a crush on him. Matter of fact, no big deal. I try to play it cool to rein in my smile, amusement, curiosity. I try out a single word, oh. She takes the word and runs with it. Yep, I'm gonna tell him after school or at recess or something. And I'm okay with whatever happens. I just wanna tell him. Monday after school, we all sit down for dinner around the kitchen counter and I tease the story out of her. She doesn't need much prompting. I told him and my friends helped me. He seemed sort of scared and ran away. And then his friends threw dirt clods at us, but they didn't hit us. He yelled and we yelled and did you know that he once kissed Joanna on the lips? I sometimes kiss Hattie on the lips, but we're just friends. Michael and I exchange looks. This is gold. 
I want to tell Harriet that she can kiss girls, and she can have crushes on her friends, and I kissed a lot of girls, and still do, and that boys are dumb and silly, but sometimes they can be really sweet, which is how I ended up with one. Instead, I just nod and ask gentle questions and help her cut her chicken and mop her messes with a dish towel. This kid, already writing love letters and dodging dirt clods at recess, she's got this. Thanks. <laughs> all right. I am so glad to have had you all here today. So grateful to all your teachers and the workshop leaders. Um, all of the logistics that it took to get this to happen. Grateful to Bill for everything that he did. We originally planned this for an outdoor day, and Bill insisted that we have it indoors and look at the weather. So thank you, Bill, and for everything else.